This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. I'm here today with uh, Fernanda Piri, who is a professor of law and anthropology, or an anthropologist who's a professor of law at uh, University of Oxford. Um, she's also the author of, of many books, including one called Anthropology of Law, one called Legalism, uh, Community and Justice, Peace and Conflict in Ladakh in India, and most recently this uh, kind of magnum opus of sorts called The Rule of Laws, A 4,000-Year Quest to order the world. Welcome, Fernanda. Thank you. So um, this idea of anthropology of law, it's, it's really kind of fascinating. Sometimes we talk about anth- law and anthropology in, in law schools. But um, I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to carve out a, a middle ground between the, the two conventional views of law, right? So for people in the field of law, we, we tend to think of law as it's an instrument of the state, right? Which is designed to to order things, uh, to um, resolve conflicts and so forth. But anthropologists, they tend to see kind of law everywhere, right? So, you know, you don't need to have any kind of formal system. It's just sort of, it's it's custom, it's, it's norms, it's um, the way that people kind of order the world. And I remember, I mean, I think everyone remembers their first encounter with, with Clifford Geertz, right? I mean, it's kind of like, a, I don't know, it's one of those things where, you know, you read this and, and as an historian, when I read Clifford Geertz, it really opened my eyes. And, you know, he has this view, I mean, he's sort of the prototypical anthropologist. He has this view that law is just, you know, kind of the, how we describe the world in, in a judgmental way, right? And so any anything which does that uh, is going to be considered part of law. But but I think you're, you're trying to argue that, well, you know, law is actually something more specific, right? It's not just any old custom. It's, it's a particular type of custom, but it's, it, it doesn't necessarily require this, you know, centralized system of, of, of state power. So how, how do we make us, how do we, what is the difference between, you know, law and just kind of the, the customs that we all seem to adhere to and, and agree upon? Well, I think you're absolutely right the way you've um, just described it and described the problem as well of those who look at law on the one hand as an instrument of the state um, and on the other hand as seeing social norms in general as law. Um, and the problem with that is that you know every, almost everything becomes law and law is just social order. And of course, that's very interesting, but um, it loses the sense of there being anything specific about law and what I think is specific is it's a certain style of making norms and rules um, in particular making them explicit so there are where I did my first field work in in the village in Ladakh which is subject to that book you mentioned peace and conflict in Ladakh nothing was written down no village constitution when they resolved conflicts, they didn't write anything down afterwards, but they all knew, we know what we do, and what's right and what's wrong and so on and so on. So it was all implicit. It was well known, but it was implicit. Other villages, um, urban centers, kingdoms, empire states, make law in a more um, deliberate way. They write things down, they create rules, they carve them on stones, they, they put them in manuscripts. They make them explicit. And once they do that, they have a sort of objective quality. They can be referred to. They're up there for people to see, for people to read. And that's something different about those sorts of rules. So, it, so it's a sort of, it's the form of the, rather than the content, which, which makes mm-hmm. a difference. And so you know, the, the fact is that our concept of law is very vague. The way we use it in everyday language, it covers all sorts of things. It covers you know, processes. Of, you know, we go to the law to, to resolve our disputes. We talk about law in general ways of, oh, the laws of you know, these people, meaning the sort of customs. We talk about law as law in the books. I mean, it's, you know, it's one of those words that's really slippery. <laughs> um, so you know, as an anthropologist and a historian, I'm interested in finding a category of forms that's that's sort of more specific there's something to look at which is might be similar which could be compared across societies Mm -hmm. so focusing on the on the form the explicit nature of rules i think brings into focus a whole set of phenomena that you know some societies make but not all 
and people make for different reasons and they invest with different sorts of um, significance. So it takes us beyond the state to examine different types of societies and compare them, but it, it draws our attention to something more specific than just social norms in general. Mm -hmm. Now you didn't spend a lot of time on the, on the ancient Greeks, right? You know, you jumped jumped into mm -hmm. the Romans, but but you know when when I studied them, I, I got the sense that they used this term, you know, nomos to include pretty much anything that was kind of man made, right? Or anything that re reflected the, the human imprint on on the world, and, and of course that included what we would consider uh, law. But but you know, law is is seems like they don't necessarily consider it in all worlds to be a, a man-made phenomenon, right? I mean, it's, it's, it seems to be something that is uh, discovered rather than made for, for some of these societies. Um, th is, is it important that it be something that's consciously constructed by the society? Yes, that's a that's a good point. And so a lot of people who do consciously construct their laws also attribute them to to God, to the cosmos, to ancient tradition. So, for example, the the, um, the Islamic legal system, it's it's really man's attempt to sorry, humans attempt to make clear God's path for the world. So it's attributed ultimately to God although it's up to human beings to sort of you know, write it down and try and make it clear. In the Hindu legal system, the laws, the texts, are supposed to reflect the cosmology, the dharma. Um, and even the common law is you know, still thought of as ancient tradition. You know, the judges are, are declaring what the law is, they're not making it, at least in theory. So often there's that sort of ideology of, of law being out there having ancient or divine or cosmological origins, um, even if it is written down. And so, of course, the, you know, the, the ancient Greek example is a really mind bending one. I've never really got my mind, <laughs> mind around it properly. And I think I, I, even the specialists find it hard to really understand what what the ancient Greeks were doing and what the, the way they invested meaning in their laws, partly because the sources are just so 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 scattered. Um, but yes, I think their their sense of nomos was was more than what we would generally call law. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it seems, I mean, in the modern world, we we have sort of a, a clear distinction between the domain of law and the domain of what we might think of as as morality or you know self improvement or you know virtue right ways of living but but it seems like a, a lot of the legal systems had their origins more in kind of right way of living you know this is how you are supposed to behave right and then other legal systems seem to have more of the opposite approach where it's really this is what you need to do because this is what the state it needs for you to do in order to maintain their their power right but 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 mo today in modern world it seems like everybody has adopted this more western view of of the law which which separates out these different domains exactly and you're absolutely right that it's very much a modern phenomenon something on the whole associated with the growth of the state that we separate out law and morality and law and religion as well and really to draw those distinctions hardly makes sense in the Islamic world, for example. So of course, Islamic law is still very much alive and well in the modern world, but it's it's itself been sort of relegated to a realm separate from the, the law of the state. So so in the Islamic world, right, the, there are these, well, there, in the Hindu world as well, there are these people who are jurists or legal experts, and, and they're often sort of in in conflict with the state. Now, look, I, I'm a lawyer and I've, I've, <laughs> I've been in, in the, in the Western, in the English Anglo American tradition, we still have this idea of the, the bar, right? And oftentimes the, the, the bar is sort of a kind of insulates us from the, from the state. I mean, this is kind of de Tocqueville's idea where it, it's, it's not necessary. I mean, they're, they're agents of the court, but they're also kind of a buffer between people and the state. And, and it seems like in in the Hindu tradition and in the Islamic tradition, there have always been these people who are defining the law. 
and and they don't necessarily have any connection to the the rulers exactly and and that phenomenon is is a feature of a large majority of the legal systems that somehow the legal experts are separate from the power holders mm-hmm. um, and that's something I was a little bit surprised about when I was writing the book at just just how often you find that in almost every example you come across and and you're right it's it's particularly explicit in the Hindu and the Muslim worlds where there are religious legal experts who are very clearly distinct from the power holders who think it's important to keep themselves apart sort of morally different or morally superior in the Hindu world um, and you know but in in Rome itself there were the jurists who were who were separate from you know the power holders they were more integrated um, and and that's as you say is the the basis of the idea of the separation of powers from between the judiciary on the one hand and the executive and the legislature on the other. Now, how do these legal systems that have origins outside of the day-to-day business of, you know, um, organizing society, you know, how do they ultimately wind up grappling with the key issues, right? Like if, if you have a, I think I was reading, you said in the Chinese legal system, you know, everything, the only way to get some kind of action was to, have a crime right and you know mm. mo- most <laughs> most of our legal business as lawyers in today's world is civil law right you know you got contract disputes and and uh, that sort of thing so if if the legal system's all about you know crimes against the state h- how do you how do you go about doing your ordinary business and and similarly right in these islamic systems i mean you know th- there's there's not the sharia seems originally to be pretty vague on issues of you know, contract enforcement and, and the day to day that, that lawyers spend all their time doing. So how do they, I mean, do they just have to use, you know, legal fictions? Do you have to kind of rummage around in, inside the, the, the law to try and find something that's, that's, that's relevant? Well, most societies have got ways of resolving disputes outside the law. And it's what you know, my colleagues in sociolegal studies, law and society, um, spend a lot of time studying forms of mediation, conciliation, alternative dispute resolution. It's all over the place, even in the contemporary society. And it's sort of the fiction of the modern state that it's really in charge of all disputes and that law covers everything. No, it doesn't and it never has done. So people have always found ways of sorting out disputes. Um, and quite often they're quite similar. If you look back in time, there are forms of mediation, which are quite similar to, to ones that happen in the contemporary world. I mean, we had the law merchant, we had the with the pie powder courts, right? Which were, mm. I guess they, they were sort of, you know, almost more like arbitration uh, organizations than agents of the state, right? Sure. And they were interesting because they were a sort of crossover between local forms of mediation and state law. So this is medieval England and the central courts, the king's courts are developing their institutions, their structures, their laws, they're getting more elaborate. But they're really places to go if you're fairly wealthy or if you've got certain types of disputes, you know, they start off really dealing with land disputes, land issues. That's what those, you know, the common law is supposed to be about, a sort of a single sort of set of rules for, for, for land ownership. And so these these more local forms of mediation, you know, the pie powder courts in the um, in the markets, in the local markets, or the tin miners courts in Cornwall, or the admiralty courts with those, you know, the fishermen on the Thames, and, you know, all these, all these very local types of institutions where people really knew what the issues were and and what the problems, how problems were going to be dealt with. Those types of courts sort of gradually took on some of the trappings of the central court, you know, the procedures. They they started using juries. Um, They started demanding the sorts of sort of documents and sorts of processes that the king's courts did. So there was a sort of coming together of, of, you know, local and central and gradually, gradually, of course, the central system sort of took over everything to assume jurisdiction for everything. But that element of sort of copying what was going on in the central courts um, was probably common to other parts of the world. It's just particularly visible in, in the scholarship on, on medieval England. 
Well, I mean, that seems to be a trend that we see throughout all of these societies is this kind of unification, right? I mean, you know, conflicts of laws is something we all study, but it, it kind of only pops up in certain intra-jurisdictional disputes, right? Like, tree, I remember I took a, mm-hmm. a course in law school where it was all about international, it's international civil litigation, and oh yeah, you got to figure out like who's got jurisdiction and so forth. But, but for the most part, you know, we have a unified legal system within, at least within certain geographies, and and so the Stannery Court, which I had never heard of the Stannery Court before <laughs> you hear a book, right? this whole court system for tin miners, right, crying out loud, and the Admiralty Court, they all kind of became unified with the single legal system, but also like the the courts that the um you know, that the feudal lords would have. I mean, they would pretty much resolve all these local disputes. D- does does the kind of convergence around a single unified legal system, is that just a product of the greater integration of the economy, right? Where, you know, if you're a peasant and you never leave one square mile, like why would you ever need anything more than the Lord's Court? Is it more about like we've got all these interdependencies or is it is it just some kind of, I don't know, rule of legal progress that is is going on i think it's well it, it might be all of those things in certain cases but i think very often the, it's about what's going on at the center and whether the people there's anyone with the, the power the influence to sort of impose their sort of law on a wider field so very often this is political you know it's what kings do when they want to establish their jurisdiction. Um, it's what the Mesopotamian kings were doing 4,000 year, years ago. They were sort of creating these law stones, writing out laws, because they wanted to consolidate, you know, the, all the the lands that they'd conquered. They wanted to persuade the people that, you know, to, 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 to give their loyalty to the king. So hear the laws, you know, come to me and I'll give you justice sort of thing. So it, it's about establishing their power and authority. And so very often political rulers will set up and sponsor um, legal systems, even if they have a separate judiciary, nevertheless, it's part of a sort of state building, if you like. But it's not just the political rulers. It's also done for religious reasons in particular. So the great Hindu, Jewish, um, Islamic legal systems aimed, had, had sort of expansive unifying aims as well but they weren't territorial they were trying to create communities of adherence to to the doctrine to you know to the religion who would all follow the same moral rules who would all be able to go to their local brahmins or muftis or um, or the local jewish courts and receive the same sort of justice so they're sort of unifying projects but some are political some are more religious. So not only did they have sort of <clears throat> different courts and different legal systems for different domains, like, you know, stuff that happened on the ocean and stuff that happened in the mm. tin mines, but it would also depend on kind of who you were. I mean, at one point, if you were, say, a um, uh, a Jew in a uh, Islamic country, you know, you would be subject to Jewish law, right? And uh, and in in, you know, if you were... A uh, priest, you'd be subject to church law and so forth. So, um, you know, why don't we see that anymore? I mean, we we kind of. I guess if you're if you're a diplomat, right? You have diplomatic immunity. But w- what's the problem with you know continuing? There are, I guess, there are some. I think there in the United States, there actually is a. Um, I, f- I forget there there you know there are Native American legal jurisdictions for certain native americans but even in some western countries in europe right they recognize islamic law Mm -hmm. for certain you know family uh relationships right well exactly and i think it's part of the problem is that the modern state tends to claim jurisdiction over everything and we think that there must be a single legal system. I mean, that's the ideology of the, moral, the, the modern state. And that's why conflict of laws is a problem, that there ought to be a single legal system. So you have certainty. And of course, you can see the sense of that. You know, if you've got an integrated political structure, it makes sense that everyone follows the same rules, that everybody knows what those rules are, that, that conflicts are minimised. 
But that's a very modern phenomenon. If you go back to the Middle Ages, as you said, and really people had no problem imagining they lived in a world where, you know, they were Jewish merchants in Cairo and they went to their local synagogue and all sorts of conflicts were, were sorted out just locally. But then they traded with merchants, you know, possibly other Jew, Jewish merchants in other parts sides of the Mediterranean. So again, they followed Jewish laws, but if there was a problem there, they might send off a petition to the legal expert in Baghdad to find an answer, you know, and, and the answer would come back <laughs> all those miles away. At the same time, they were subject to, you know, the Mamluks or whoever was in power in Egypt at the time, which was an Islamic, Islamic regime. And so if they had problems with neighbors who weren't Jewish, they would have to go to the Islamic courts. Um, and maybe there was a Christian community as there, so there'd be other ways of, of sorting things out there. So I, I'm not saying there wasn't a problem. I think there probably often, there often were problems with these sort of overlapping jurisdictions, but it was much more accepted as, as the norm. Um, um, so yes, we, we tend to regard it as a bit of a sort of exception now that, oh yes, the Jews and the Muslims have got their own Sharia courts for their family problems. And so there's sort of little space has been carved out for them to do that. But then if we think about the transnational realm, you know, if you go off and you're in international finance or international trade and you've got disputes with people from you know, Europe or China or whatever, there are all sorts of international sort of treaties and schemes and principles, you know, international principles about finance and so on and arbitration. Mm -hmm. And people go off there, they just accept that that's where they need to go. Rather yeah, you than can. I love, courts. I love how you can. Yeah, you, know, you can. Choice of law, choice of forum, right? So you know, you get into a contract. You're like, I want to have, you know, Swiss law in uh, in in a London court <laughs> or whatever, right? You, know, you can do that stuff now, but mm. but but uh, but I think um, you talk a bit about colonialism, right? And and I think the the original idea that many of the colonial powers had, including the English, was, you know, we're, we're just going to come in and. You know, we're we're going to apply English law to all the English people, and uh, we're gonna, we're going to let everything. You know, we we don't have the, the infrastructure to get involved in in all these local disputes, mm. and and so the idea was just to leave everything alone. But but it's, it seems like almost unintentionally and inadvertently, the the colonial law wound up taking over everything. Now, is that is that is that was that really? I mean, one possibility is that. Just like if a colonial power shows up with electricity, it's going to spread. I mean, it's you know better technology, it better adapted to the modern world. Um, but but it, you know another story is is just that you can't have these these conflicts, and ultimately the more powerful uh, you, you know jurist is gonna, is going to is going to drive out the other. And so it's driven by state power. Is, and that, that state power story could have also be driven by the successors to the colonialists, right? They, they also are interested in maximizing state power. So is it, is it sort of a state power story or is it more like a technology story? Can we think in terms of legal technology and uh, kind of more sophisticated legal technology? In other words, you know, is, there, is there a progress story here that, that we could look at? Yeah, I think progress is very different difficult word, dangerous word to use, because, mm -hmm. you know, that's so much the way that, you know, the story of law and progress mm -hmm. and, and modernity is told, you know, it's, everything is, is much better. And that's a story that the colonialists told as well. You know, they were bringing well, within, with, enlightenment well, within to an, civilization. Within, it, within anthropology, I know it's a, it's a big, uh, it's, it's, it's a very contest, contested notion, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the fact was that, you know, up until, you know, the the 16th, 17th centuries, you know, the, the Eastern legal systems were way more sophisticated than anything in Europe. It's just the colonials conveniently forgot about that when they decided to march into, you know, India and Indonesia and Africa. Um, so let's, let, let's set aside the idea of progress. But I think you're right that it's that colonialism was a sort of, well, it's a multifaceted story anyway. But in legal terms, there was certainly in part the imposition of centralized standards. So, um, uh, so the colonialists went around setting up courts everywhere. And 
um, they expected a lot of local conflicts to come to those courts. So they thought they could apply Indian law or African law or whatever. And they, they tried in lots of cases to work out what it was to write it down, but they did a pretty bad job on the whole. So in effect, they instituted a very new legal system. But at the same time, um, a lot of the indigenous, particularly the indigenous elites, got drawn into the colonial system, of course, and it was partly deliberate. You know, that's, that's the way colonialism unfolds. Of course, you need to co-opt, particularly the, the local power holders. So they, they, they got jobs within the system or within the new economy um, and found it useful to use the new courts, the new laws. So it's partly about new types of economy new types of markets, new types of land holding, which then necessitate or make new types of laws or make them more useful. So, so, so particularly in Africa, there was that tension between communal forms of land holding, which were very widespread, and the more individualistic forms of land holding that the colonialists thought were just had to be introduced. Um, or at least even if not always individualistic, at least more certain, more specified. Um, and once that in system had been imposed, as it generally was, it became very difficult to continue to operate with the more communal forms of land holding, you know, kin related um, land ownership. So there was a lot of undermining of existing systems, you know, economic and social systems, um, which then made people encouraged people to turn to these new courts um, for, for, for address and for problems. Yeah, not a happy story. Well, I remember, you know, you talk about uh, Hastings, right? And you know, mm. some people were really trying to understand the, the local uh, language, the local courts and cultures. But at the end of the day, most of the colonialists would just sort of, to the extent that they did immerse themselves in it, they would tend to translate it back into terms that, that they could they could understand. And so it kind of wound up getting getting distorted. And I'm wondering, I mean, the anthropological project is one where you really try to situate yourself within within the culture. And I mean, this seems like a very difficult thing to do. Right? I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, you went to Ladakh. I mean, you, you know, you've, you've, you've been to Tibet. Uh, you know, you talk about the, the Goloks and, and, you know, the Yemenis and the Dagestanis. I mean, is it, is it really possible to, I mean, how well can you really understand something that is, is that, that distant and that, that remote? Um, I mean, how diff, and, and if, I mean, it seems like it would take a whole lifetime to just become even like a, half Ladakh type, type person. <laughs> do, do, are you yeah. equipped with, with kind of skills that enable you to kind of understand more quickly? Do, do, you, are you, do you have to develop the capacity to kind of put blinders on the frameworks that you bring to the table? Or do you, have, do you, do you necessarily remain somewhat detached as an anthropologist? Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. It's, it's a difficult and inevitably imperfect process. Um, but our modern anthropology has developed um, uh, the sort of methods which I suppose, which, which we feel can bring us as close as we can to that type of understanding from the inside. And it's partly going in with the right attitude. You, know, you want to try to understand things from the inside. You want to almost get inside other people's heads and work out how they see the world, how they make sense of things around them. And, and it's hard because all the time, we go out to a place we don't we don't know. We maybe don't know the language. No, language learning is vitally important. So we can listen to what people are saying, even if they're not talking to us. We don't rely on translators. We get the nuance. Um, and of course, that takes an enormous amount of time. Now, that's why typically people doing a PhD in anthropology will spend a year somewhere to learn the language, to, to build up trust so that people talk to them about things which they might not otherwise talk to strangers about. So we get, well, in those sorts of ways, we get as close as we can to the people, to their problems, to the way they think, to the way they see the world. And of course, it's only ever imperfect, but 
you know, we have to try, we have to do as far as go as far as we can. But then when we're trying to to work out what it all means, to write up our thesis or our book, or to enter into conversation with other people, to tell them what we've what we've seen, all the time, again, we have to be careful about the words we're using. How can I sort of because then we become the translators. How can I translate what I what I saw, what I understood into terms that will make sense to other people? You're just translating into a different language, the language of writing in for a start. So so that's sort of the ideal basis for this this type of exploration. And of course it, it, it's difficult if you're working with historical materials. To some extent we have to to, to some extent, we have to do more guesswork. Um, and, and our historian colleagues always look at us and say, oh, but it's so easy for you, because if you're trying to understand what people do, you just ask them. And of course, it's never as simple as that. You ask people, oh, and very often they'll just go, why are you asking that question? You know, people are often bad at explaining things. They just do naturally. So we have to interpret even if we're, we have, we have to try and find ways of getting at the truth, you know, um, even if we're anthropologists. In the same ways, historians have to try and interpret their material. So why do people write like this? What were they trying to do? But it's partly about asking the right questions, trying to put yourself in the mind of the, the people who wrote those laws or that document or had that dispute. You know, why were they, why were they talking in, in using that language? Why did this seem important? So, yes, it's always imperfect, but, you know, we have to do the best we can. Well, of course, the difference between going to, say, Ladakh and talking to the people there and doing this historical anthropology is that when you do the historical research, you're limited to the kind of written records to some degree. Exactly. Does, does, that, does that, do you think that distorts our historical perspective, the fact that, you know, we... we do we overweight the, the legal aspects of it? I mean, you, you mentioned that like Egypt and the Aztecs and the Incas, I mean, they didn't mm -hmm. have any, you know, written, written law. I mean, did, did they have, did they have law if they didn't have written law or, you know, how, how can we understand what, 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 what that was like? I mean, do we just sort of infer how, how do we, how do we get a sense of, of what, what was going on in those societies? Well, you're absolutely right. It, it's limiting. It's very limiting in terms of what we can then do. So hence ancient Greece being such a puzzle, you know, the, the sources make it just difficult for us to work out what was going on. Whereas in other cases, but a lot more was written and it's, and it's, we've got more to, more to work with. But I think the case of Egypt and you know, the Aztecs and the Incas is a bit different. I mean, particularly, I mean, the Aztecs and Incas are, are, are um, frustrating for historians because so much was destroyed in the, you know, the, the colonial encounter, the Spanish occupation, um, and not a lot was reduced to writing anyway. Egypt is different. There were you know, lots of records from Egypt. You know, they had sophisticated writing systems, but there they seem to have, as it were, chosen not to make laws. Um, certainly from about the second century, second millennium BC onwards, they were in contact with Mesopotamia, where they'd also developed writing and developed laws and um, legal codes. So it's almost as if the Egyptians just chose to continue to run their society in a different way. So, I mean, unless we suddenly discover discover a whole lot of laws that we didn't know existed in Egypt. I think we have to analyze that as a, you know, an effective, powerful, sophisticated administration that nevertheless chose not to organize itself in terms of explicit rules. You know, there were orders, there were tax systems, there were power structures, but nobody wanted to create these explicit sets of laws. Now, the entire world is governed more or less by what we would call kind of Western legal systems, even India and, and China, right? The ones that had kind of alternative legal traditions, they're, they're pretty much, you know, using like, I don't know, Prussian, you know, civil codes and so forth. And and if you trace that all the way back, I mean, I think you, you trace it all the way back to Hammurabi, right? So really, mm -hmm. you know, the Western legal tradition has its origins in, in Mesopotamia. Um, 
and what is what is unique about it, right? What is what is what is it about the Chinese and the Indian and the Islamic? I mean, I guess we still have even in the Islamic world, they still have right legal codes which are Western legal codes superimposed on top of, of Sharia law. But what is? I mean, I guess Saudi Arabia is a little bit different. I mean, they may not have adopted that much of the Western legal system, but you know, what is it, what is it that makes that distinctive? If, if you were to say the key differences between that Hammurabi tradition and the, the Indian Islamic and, and Chinese traditions. I mean, what's, what's distinctive about the modern Western well, the, tradition? That the, the, flows all the way back to Hammurabi. Oh, I right? see. What it, so so mm. if, you were, if you were to place bets, if you went back, and, <laughs> you know, I don't know, 2,500 years ago, or I guess it, we didn't have the, I mean, the Indian tradition, the Chinese tradition, and the the Roman tradition kind of all emerged around the same time. And if you had mm. to you know place bets, what would what would it be about that Roman tradition that was unique? There is nothing intrinsically superior, I don't think, about the tradition that flowed from Mesopotamia, and it went through so many iterations. You know, it inspired the Jewish tradition. You know, the right of the Old Testament, undoubtedly drew on precedence from Mesopotamia. And that was a very different system. The you know, Mesopotamian system was, it was a royal, it was royal laws. It was the laws of the rulers. And the Israelites took, took that, took inspiration from that and made laws for a dispersed nation, which didn't, which wasn't then centrally organized. You know, in the, the, um, you know after the fall of the um, early Isra Israelite kingdoms, and then that tradition in turn inspired the Islamic system. Again, a religious based, not a politically based system. Um, well, at the same time, it inspired you know, Rome, as you say, which then formed the basis for or was very influential in, in the legal systems that developed in Europe. So that tradition sort of took many, many twists and turns and went off in lots of different directions. Um, and meanwhile, the Indian and the Chinese were developing in their own ways in their own, in their own regions and they're often overlapping you know when the moguls came into india there was the the there was a, a form of the islamic law among certain sections of society whereas the other, you know, the hindu kings and the hindu communities were doing their own thing <laughs> with their own laws it's 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 really a quirk of fate or chance or geopolitics that means has meant that the traditions that developed in Europe, which were successors to the Roman and ultimately the Mesopotamian system, that those systems should have come to dominate the world. And it's largely through the rise of the nation state, modernity, colonialism. So it's partly about imposition, it's partly about copying. I, I don't think you could have gone back you know, 2000 years and said, oh, well, this is the one. You know, for a long time, the most sophisticated legal system in the world was in China. You know, it was, and it lasted about 2,000 years in, you know, it came and went to different dynasties, but it was pretty solid, pretty complex, pretty effective um, for the different successive Chinese dynasties and governing vast land and number of people. You know, you'd have probably put your money on China. <laughs> Well, I like I like this term you said. They, the Chinese legal uh, folks thought of the Chinese law like a net, right? And the, mm. and the, net, the holes in the net needed <laughs> to get bigger or, or smaller depending on the the specifics. Uh, I thought I love that, right? So it really meant that there was quite a bit of discretion in the it, jurists as to how to apply the, the the legal principles. Exactly. I mean, they were, they were they were realists about what law could do and what it couldn't do. You know, if you make too many too many laws and the holes are too small, then people have got no room to maneuver and they won't obey the law anymore. If it's too big, then people will find ways of avoiding the law. I agree. It's a nice it's a nice image, but it does it does give the sense, doesn't it, that law was there to sort of control. You know, it was a it was an instrument of the state, and I think that's very much the way the Chinese saw their laws as something which they could manipulate to control their people, their territory. Now, look when you when you take this universal approach and you zoom out, um, a lot of the European legal systems kind of merge together. But when you get back down to the ground in the world that you know you and I both both live in, then the English exceptionalism kind of 
<laughs> it comes to the fore. And, and I, I was sort of schooled in the English exceptionalism tradition and, and, you know, Pollock and Maitland. I mean, that was mm-hmm. my, that was, you know, that was my Bible for a while. And, and it really, um, and a lot of people still continue to think of the English legal tradition as, as unique and distinct even from the other European legal traditions. And I just did an interview with, with uh, Jim Robinson and we talked about the you know, European scissors, which is, you know, the combination of this Roman tradition with the kind of Germanic traditions, which are more um, bottom up. Right. So the Roman is kind of top down and, and the Germanic tradition is, is kind of bottom up. Is the, the English legal tradition, does it deserve to be considered kind of unique or, or is it just a different flavor of this Western tradition of, of jurisprudence? Well, I suppose I haven't been brought up in the English legal tradition myself and practiced at the bar for a while. I ought to say, yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's a sort of wonderful, historic, sophisticated, well-adapted legal system that you know, really ought to be rolled out over the whole world. And of course, there is a lot to be said for it. It, it has developed organically. It's the fact that there aren't... It, it's not based on you know, sort of foundational legal codes maybe means it's more adaptable. But really, that's a, that's a specialist area of law, which my colleagues here in the faculty know a lot more about than than I do. And taking taking a, a, a more sort of global perspective, they very quickly merge into one you know, as, as, as instruments of the state, they op- the civil and the common law system really operate in very similar sorts of ways. And the distinctions between them, you know, important though they are, do tend to fade when we start to look at the very many other types of laws there are around the world. Well, and, and I think that when people talk about kind of judge-made law and case law, I mean, it doesn't seem that it's that unique. I mean, the distinction might be overrated. You talk about some of the early... Um, early legal systems where when it was written down, it wasn't written down in the form of general principles. Sometimes you just have these stories right? where, mm. you know, some mm. guy came in and he had a cow and, and he did this and that was the law. And then everybody tries to figure out how do you <laughs> apply that story to the situation at hand? Um, is, is there, is, is that a different type of legal reasoning, you know, store kind of more story based case based as opposed to, you know, if you, if you, you know, injure a person in this way, you, you know, you pay this penalty, boom, full stop. Yes. Um, I, mean, I, I, I suppose, I suppose the case-based legal reasoning sort of approximates or gradually approximates in the common law system to um, the reasoning which is based on written laws on legislation, for example. So, you know, through, through precedent, you know, one judge will say as what the, the rule was in this previous case was X. And so then the people writing the textbooks come down and they say, oh, here we are. This is what the law is, which you're going to strap the cases. It becomes almost like a bit of legislation. Um, but I, I think the sort of the judge based reasoning probably is more widespread than it seems. It seemed to me looking at what Hammurabi's code, for example, it looks like a bit of legislation. It's written up there. It's fixed. It's not. It's not work in progress, as it was, as it were. But it does reflect individual cases, and so, and it was very specific, and it covered some topics. It didn't cover other topics. So you know, the question is, well, why was this? Why was this written up if it was only sort of partial like that? So I think the, the for people to use it at all, it must. To, they must have approached it in the sort of the way we approach precedent. You know, oh well, this is what the rule says. That sort of case. So by analogy, it must be right to do this in this case. Or well, my case is a little bit different, so I'm going to do something a little bit different. So I, yes, I do think that, that common law style of reasoning, we have to sort of read into the way in which people used quite a lot of different laws throughout history. Mm-hmm. Well. Um... You know, you spend a whole chapter on on feuds, right? And mm-hmm. uh, well, not on feuds, on um, you know, uh, uh, trial by battle, and you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, and it seemed to be quite common that you would resolve a dispute by getting into a, I don't know, a duel or or um, you know, a fight, or you you know, carry some 
hot piece of iron and, you know, this sort of thing. Um, I mean, to an outsider, if, if you're not raised in that tradition, it just seems ab- absurd, right? Um, mm-hmm. I, I just saw the, I just saw the Crucible recently, and, and I think in, in the, one of the scenes they talk about this guy who they just pressed with stones, right? <laughs> you know, and, 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 and yet that kind of persisted for long periods of time before it was kind of abolished. I mean, some would argue that today it's, it's kind of similar. Like whoever can spend the most on a lawyer, you know, is, gonna, <laughs> is likely to win. And that's not that much different mm. from, from, you know, dueling. Um, but, but, you know, why is that, why did we have those sorts of, of things? Was it just a way mm-hmm. of, um, I guess, benefiting the, the, the wealthier? I mean, did that somehow play out if you were wealthy you could afford better armor and therefore you're more likely to win a, a, a trial by by fire so to speak mm. i think i mean it was a surprise for a start it was a surprise to find that the same sort of techniques were used so widely throughout the world you know that's the only chapter in the book where which doesn't have a geographical or a temporal focus mm-hmm. because it's one of the few issues which do seem to me to be widespread. And yeah, I was as surprised as you when I when I looked at this and I saw this. I think what's key to it is the problem of finding the truth. Mm-hmm. And of course, there's always going to be a problem with finding the truth in some cases. You know, he said, she said, there weren't any other witnesses. How are we ever going to know what happened? Or did someone intend to kill? Or was it self-defense? Uh, did somebody consent really, or did they not? You know, these problems are actually universal. And of course, I mean, they, could have, they could have just they could have just flipped a coin, right? Wouldn't that well? That, that would work, right? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think there was always a feeling that they had to somehow get to get to a sort of justice. There had to be some form of of of, of doing the right thing anyway. So. So what was really common was, well, I suppose oaths and ordeals. Those are the two the, the two techniques that people seem to have come up with all throughout the world. So, you know, an oath is invocation of the divine. And, you know, it, it's easy to forget how important and effective that would have been through really most societies throughout history. You know, if you swear on, you know, the Bible or... You invoke the gods, whoever they are, um, to be your witness. You're telling the truth. That's a pretty important thing to do, and something people won't do lightly. And and in in practice, in practice, they were surrounded by you know rituals. You'd have to go to the church or the temple, and there would be the sort of um, you know the the, the 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 frescoes on the wall showing you know where you go to in hell if you <laughs> if you sin too much you know this is sort of there's lots of drama surrounding these things but very often what the um uh, the the procedure was was you, only, you could only swear an oath if you were thought to be oath worthy if you were trustworthy enough and that generally meant being high enough status so not necessarily wealthy but really high enough status to to, to be trusted so the ordeal was the alternative largely for the people who couldn't be trusted, the people the lower down the hierarchy. So whereas with the oath, the witness themselves, or the parties who were, who were swearing, would invoke the divine, and that was sort of the, the threat of sanction if they were not telling the truth. But the people who weren't deemed to be oath-worthy, the whole process by which they you know, held hot iron in their hands and their hands were bandaged up and then they inspected it to see if it healed or not or they were dunked in water and did they float or not. All those processes invoked the divine to sort of give a direct sign to everybody else as to whether or not the person was, was guilty or innocent. And of course those processes could be ma- manipulated. You know, somebody had to look at the hand and say, that's healed or not. Somebody had to say, oh, yes, that person has floated or no, they haven't floated. Mm. So in reality, a lot of these, these processes um, depended on the local people, the local priest, mm. maybe, or the local community, who probably had a fairly good idea of whether or not the person was telling the truth or not. So it was in many ways a popularity contest, right? So if you had made enemies, mm. right, in the community, uh, if you were... You know, kind of like with gossip, right? So if, mm. if if you hadn't 
if you hadn't um, forged relationships with enough people, then you're, you're probably going to lose this thing. It's yes, <laughs> probably mm -hmm. depending on the community and its coherence. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but now, interesting, but sorry, I, I was just going to say behind it all seems to be, and here I'm relying very much on the work of, of James Whitmer, the kind of the comparative historical liar, um, who wrote a, a very good book, um, about uh, reasonable doubt. And he was saying behind all of this, there was often the fear on the part of the judges of what would happen to them if they got it wrong and convicted mm -hmm. the wrong person, particularly if they put the wrong person to death. You know, they were worried about divine retribution. So very often these processes were designed to allow judges to convict and to punish with, with certainty because there'd been a divine sign. Now, as, as an, I, I Jillian Tett wrote a book recently about anthropology, and, and she said, um, you know, part of it's about understanding the other, but part of it's about understanding yourself better, right? And, and you know, it always made me, th I know Herodotus was the kind of first anthropologist or whatever, but I always think about um, when I read Persian Letters by Montesquieu, right, and how mm. powerful that was, because even though it was completely fictional, it was, what does the world look like? What does Europe look like, right, through, through a Persian lens? And, uh, and, and a lot of the stuff that people took for granted looked ridiculous, right? And <laughs> so um, how does being taking an anthropological perspective help you to better understand the, the traditions that you yourself participated in and, and practiced as, as an attorney? And, and do, do you think that this should be a part of legal education, right? I, I don't know, probably got to be less than 1% of lawyers get exposed to legal anthropology at probably less than 10 percent at least in the u.s get exposed even to non-us or non-anglo legal systems right so um you know is this is this something that can improve the the practice of of law and the the legal process does it make you a better lawyer do you think to have just a modicum of exposure to to legal anthropology I, I think the benefit is sort of fairly indirect. I mean, I don't think we should be going around to different parts of the world to try to learn techniques which we can apply to our own legal system. But understanding how, I suppose, specific our own legal system is and how recent it is in the terms of world history and how um, it it's not... You know, we can't understand that has been the culmination of 4,000 years of history, you know, the best legal system we've got or we could ever had. It's just something that happens to be here now. And there are all sorts of other traditions that are developed in different in different places. I think that is, is important so that certainly those who come into a position of being able to influence the shape of a legal system are aware that this is not the only answer there is. This is this is not the only possible system. And there are two particular areas where I think having a sense of the way other people approach disputes and law is important. And one is when dealing with transnational um, aspects. You know, the, the fact is that um, you know, a lot of international lawyers worry about, is there enforcement? Are things democratic? They, they apply the ideals, the ideologies of the modern nation state to the sorts of legal processes that develop transnationally because they have to because they're transnational problems and i think it's important not to just assume that everything has got to work like state law works it's important to allow that there can be effective ways of approaching disputes and, and making laws which might work in different ways so that's one area and the other area is in that of sort of local local systems of justice um which which still very much much continue so there's been the law and development movement. There's been the movement for transitional justice, you know, to try and roll out forms of better forms of law and justice throughout the world. Again, often the assumption is that we in the West know what we're doing. We've got it right. We've got the best systems. We've got the right principles. And, it, and it, those sorts of programs can run roughshod over local dynamics. 
Um, it, there are lots of case studies of, of people who've looked at transitional justice programs in the aftermath of conflict. And of course, everyone wants to help um, those who've suffered from conflict to, to receive justice and so on. But if, if those programs don't reflect and correspond with local dynamics, they'll never work. So there's are two, two areas in which I think just an awareness of the, the many alternatives there are is important for all of us. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, right now we have sort of creeping, cre you know, the, the, the law expands its sphere sort of continuously. I think the, the default response of someone who's involved in a dispute today would be to summon the power of the state. Right. So, you know, if you're if you're in the playground and and, and, mm. and, and someone's, uh, you know, bullying you. Right. The idea is to call the call the state first. Right. Um, and, you know, the, the, I guess the restorative justice movement is, is a movement to try to let people within the community help resolve some disputes and and uh, and, and and create reconciliation. Do, do we under under appreciate and undervalue these other non-state institutions and their role in kind of resolving disputes and, and maintaining the peace and uh, creating harmony? I think often we do, absolutely. Um, but also sometimes I think we underestimate how difficult it is to, to develop those institutions mm -hmm. from scratch. Um, you know, we can't just take a model that's worked somewhere else and assume it's going to work in a different context. You know, it's all about understanding the local dynamics, which are different. And, you know, who are the power holders? Who do people listen to? Who has respect? What are the tensions in the community? What are the prejudices? You know, all of that comes into the effectiveness of any sort of local local systems. But yes, I mean, there are lots of good restorative justice programs that have been tried out. And, you know, we've got to try them and see, really. And if something works, support it. Well, Fernanda, thank you so much for joining me. The, the rule of laws, it's definitely not a Whig history. right? It's, <laughs> it's, it's really, uh, you know, very, very uh, uh, sympathetic to all the different legal traditions that you uh, articulate. And don't forget, of course, these other books that are like the... Anthropology of Law and the book on, on Ladakh. And you've also got some wonderful articles <laughs> that I read in Oxford Journal and elsewhere. So thanks so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.